Hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to do a walkthrough of just the long answer version or portion of the exam. So portion two and three were long answer versions, long answer portions. So that's what I'll go over. So, all right, question number one is the following production function characterized by increasing constant or decreasing returns to scale show rigorously kind of as, des as demonstrated in uh, class. And so the production technology we have here is Cobb Douglas, Q is equal to 49 L to the 0.25 times uh, K to the 0.75. And staring at this, you can sum up the exponents and you know, yeah, 0.25 plus 0.75 is gonna be one. So this is constant returns to scale. Well, that's not showing rigorously. Like that's recognizing this is constant returns to scale, but we wanna show it rigorously. How do we do this? Well. Think about the definition. So definition of constant returns to scale means if we multiply the inputs by some factor, that's the same as multiplying the output, right? If you double the inputs, if you get exactly double the output, that's constant returns to scale. If you double the input and get more than double the output, that's increasing returns to scale. If you double your inputs and get less than double the output, that's decreasing returns to scale. So what we'll do is I'll just evaluate some T, some scaling factor, arbitrary scaling factor, times the amount of labor times the amount of capital. All right, so this is gonna be 49 T times the amount of labor, this is raised to the power, and then T times the amount of capital, that's raised to the power. And then just, it's an application of power rules, right? This, when you have something, some product raised to an exponent, in parentheses, that's the same as uh, each individual uh, constituent portion from the product raised to that same exponent. Multiplication's commutative, so I can move these together. And then if we have the same base, then you add the exponents as I've got here. And then we realize, oh, okay, so indeed, yeah, that sums up to one. So this is T times F of LK, right? Because I'm recognizing that 49 L to the 0.25 K to the three fourths is gonna be exactly where we started from. So that's how I made this substitution back. And then I say, oh yeah, scaling up the inputs by some constant factor T is the same as multiplying the output. So that's constant returns to scale. All right, a Lodi has a factory producing widgets using the following production technology. W is equal to 500 L to the 0.2, K to the 0.6, where W is the amount of, is the output of widgets. L is labor, K is capital. The wage is $10 per unit of labor used. I realize I use capital W for widgets, but here I've given us the, the wage, so you shouldn't have these uh, little lowercase Ws. You shouldn't have any confusion with W since I've literally given us a W. Uh, the rental rate of capital is 50 cents per unit. If a Lodi wants to produce as many widgets as possible using the $2,000 received from the government to support the business during the pandemic, how should the budget be split between labor and capital? So you, you actually kind of have to think about this question a little bit, determine kind of what it's asking for, right? We actually want to produce as many widgets, as much output as possible with $2,000. So this is an output maximization problem, right? It's output maximization subject to the constraint of remaining within this $2,000 budget. And so what ends up, what ends up happening is we're going to hire 50 units of labor, 3,000 units of capital. Why? Well, all right. So we know what the tangency condition is going to, or if you set up the Lagrangian, find the marginal rate of technical substitution, find our, uh, find our slope of our ISO cost, take the ratio of the take the ratio of our factor prices that gives us this tangency condition of k over 3l and then 10 over 1 half so let me kind of back out a little bit of where this is coming from because i realize now it's, that my solution has a little bit shorthand this is w over r right 10 divided by 0.5 right w over r that's what this is and then over here this k over 3l well this is think of this derivative here i'm going to take the I'm going to take the marginal product of labor, so it's going to be 0.2 times 500 L to the minus 0.8 K to the 0.6. And then I'm going to take my marginal product of capital, that's going to be 0.6 times 500 L to the 0.2 times K to the 0.6 minus, or sorry, minus 0.4. And when you divide marginal product of labor by marginal product of capital, you'll get this K over 3, uh, K over 3 L. And so then we get this nice tangency condition that we can then substitute in. Uh, for capital, right? So we're going to get K is equal to 60 L, which I'm going to replace capital in my budget constraint because I want to stay within 
two thousand dollars wait a second budget well yeah sure think about this this is my my expenditure on labor is going to be 10 times the amount of labor plus my expenditure on capital 0.5 times the amount of capital has to be within the two hundred dollar two thousand dollars we've been given from the government all right so that makes sense so we've got this here and then solving yeah we'll get our our labor is 50 and our capital is three thousand all right last one zoom pizza uh real pizza establishment in the Bay Area, which is fully automated uh, for delivery. Uh, suppose their production process is given by this here, this part's made up, where L is the amount of labor, K is the amount of capital, and alpha is positive. Assume the rental rate of capital is $10. What's the lowest cost to produce 240 pizzas, assuming the wage is W, and the rental rate of capital is 10? Uh, at the moment, assuming that alpha and wage are the same. Uh, suppose Zoom updates its production process to Q is equal to, oh, these are perfect subs now, where we have uh, labor capital, still alpha is positive, assume rental rate of capital is 10. If we, if we observe Zoom Pizza has produced 240 pizzas using a fully automated production process, what can we conclude about the relationship between alpha and the wage? And then how much does it cost Zoom Pizza to produce 240 pizzas using the fully automated process? So basically what I'm asking you to do here is a cost minimization problem initially using these perfect complements technology and then I want you to solve the cost minimization problem using the perfect subs technology and then find actually what's the cost associated with that situation. All right, so when we're solving the perfect complements cost minimization problem, if we want to produce 240 pizzas, this is going to be 240 and that's got to be equal to whatever is the smaller of these two. Well, we don't want there to be a waste, so it's going to be actually 240 is equal to alpha L and then 240 is equal to 10K. And so we find, oh, L has to be 240 over alpha, K has to be 240 over 10, or 24 units of capital. And then what's, this, what's the cost going to be? Well, the cost would be uh, W, right, the wage times the amount of labor plus the expenditure on capital. And it turns out it's going to be 480. How do I get that? Well, I realize we've made the assumption W is equal to alpha. That cancels off, so I'm going to get 240 plus 240. Uh, it's 480. Okay, cool. For part B, now we're going to compare alpha over 10 and W over 10. Why? Well, alpha over 10 is the ratio of our marginal products, our slope of my ISO quant, and then W over 10 is my slope of my ISO cost, right? Because now I have per, uh, perfect complements preference or perfect complements technology, and so my marginal product of labor is alpha, marginal product of capital is 10, and so it's going to be alpha over 10. Sure enough, and then the factor prices we are given is W and then 10. This has to be, in a situation where we have a fully automated production process, this has to be the case that alpha is less than or equal to W. I mean, so if it's strictly less than W, that's when we have our, uh, that, that's when we have our all, um, our, our Alex solution, our, uh, our uh, let's see, so if we have, wait, let me, let me, what, do we, what do we do here? So. Alpha, so this is my ISO cost, uh, ISO cost. So if my ISO, if my ISO quant has the, has the, if my ISO quant is flatter, my ISO quant is steeper, no, this is my alley solution, right? So indeed, I can't read the thing I've got here. The lowest ISO cost crosses at the K axis, right? So what's happening is we have our ISO quant is, is uh, flatter, our ISO costs are steeper, and so that we can sneak the smallest ISO cost in along the vertical axis. And so that's what's happening here. Lowest ISO cost crosses at the K axis. And as a matter of fact, maybe I can, that was exactly what I did not want to do. And so, but what I did want to do is I did want to get a picture and I wanted to show real quickly. So here's my ISO quant, all right? And then I've got a collection of ISO costs that are steeper. And <laughs> presumably they all have the same slope. No, they actually do because it's linear. So, all right. So this is what's giving rise to the to the all K solution. We had K on the vertical. Oh, that's not a K anymore. And then we had L on the horizontal. Anyway, so we want to find the cost associated with producing using our all K solution. Well, what's this going to cost? This is going to be the amount of output divided by the marginal product, or uh, mar the the amount of output divided by marginal product gives me the amount of capital we need, and then how much does capital cost? 10 times capital, so 240 is the cost. All right, so here's my puppy study break. Here's Ani playing with the water and jumping away from it. Ani loves water. 
as you can tell. All right. So let's see. For part three, portion three, we have another three questions. So the first one is our percentage markup formula. So suppose currently the price elasticity demand is minus nine eighths. The firm produces a marginal cost of a dollar. What's the profit maximizing price per unit? And what, what effect do we expect on elasticity over time if, renter, if rivals enter the market? I mean, you can answer this immediately. With entry, we expect demand is gonna get more elastic because there's more substitutes. So we're gonna expect this is gonna get big. Right, the absolute value of price elasticity of demand. Price elasticity of demand greater than one is gonna be elastic demand. And so uh, we're expecting this to get even larger. Sure enough, this is elastic demand, right? Nine, nine over eight uh, is gonna be bigger than one. And that's telling us that actually this firm, this profit maximizing firm isn't making a mistake. You wouldn't wanna produce on the inelastic portion of the demand curve, you wanna produce on the elastic portion of the demand curve. So anyway, so this is gonna work out just fine. We have our percentage markup formula. This is gonna be price minus marginal cost divided by price. Is So this is markup, price minus marginal cost. Dividing it by the price makes it the percentage markup. And then this is the negative of one over price elasticity demand. This, the right hand side is positive, right? Because epsilon is negative. So the negative negative is positive. And sure enough, I'll have one over nine eighths is the same as eight ninths. And then hopefully, I, I hope this is really quick for you. I hope this is a quick exercise because as you're staring at this, you're like, wait a second, how does this work? Well, price has to be nine, right? Nine minus one is eight, eight ninths. I think that's beautiful. All right, so we've got that one, cool. Consider the monopolist uh, facing two different segments of demand. The first group of demanders is representable by price is equal to two minus two Q, and then the second by price is equal to one minus Q. Marginal costs are the same, zero, and there's no fixed cost. So what happens if you're unable to treat the groups as separate, find the profit maximizing price, uh, price, quality, price and quantity and profits? Here, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna pool these two, these two demands. So I'm gonna solve for Q and then sum them up, and then I'm gonna solve my MR equals MC to find the profit maximizing single price monopolies uh, price and quantity. Now, what if the monopoly is able to practice third degree price discrimination? Well, now I'm going to do MR equals MC for these two segments of the demand, right? All right. So in the first case, what I want to do is combine my overall, combine my demands, get the overall market demand. It turns out it's going to be Q is equal to two minus 1.5 P, right? I solved each of these for Q. So I'm going to get a Q and then I'm going to get a, uh, I'm going to, I have a, so I solve for Q, so over here I'm gonna get Q is equal to one minus P, over here I'm gonna get two Q is equal to uh, two minus P and then dividing through by two, and that's how we ended up with this right here, that's where I get the 1.5 from. Anyway, then what we need to do is we need to find the inverse demand, so I'm gonna solve this for P now. The reason why is because once I've got my vertical intercept, I can double the slope and that gets me my marginal revenue. So. Right, the marginal revenue has the same vertical intercept but twice the slope as my demand curve. So I'm just gonna double my, this is my slope, I'm gonna double that. So two thirds becomes four thirds and this is marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Right? This is a revenue maximization problem actually because my marginal cost is zero. And sure enough, I mean, the other way you could do this is you could say, okay, let's find the midpoint of this thing. But easy enough to just stare at this, oh, my quantity is one. And then if the quantity is one, we can go back and we find the associated, we can find the associated price. So if quantity is one, the price is two thirds, and then profits are gonna be two thirds. Profits are calculated as price minus average total cost, that whole thing times quantity. And that's where the two thirds came from. All right, so now if we are able to practice third degree price discrimination, we'll set MR equals MC for the two groups. Group one gives us one minus uh, two Q is equal, to, uh, is equal to zero. It's just a revenue maximization problem. So it's easy enough just to stare at it and find the midpoint. Right? So it's gonna be Q is equal to one half. And then if the quantity is one half, the price, the mid, this is the vertical intercept, it's gonna, it's gonna pair us with a price of one half. And then profits are gonna be Oh, price minus marginal cost times quantity. So uh, one half times one half is one fourth. Group two is gonna be two minus four Q is equal to zero. Uh, y, this is my marginal revenue. This is my marginal cost. Again, my quantity is gonna be one half. Now the price is gonna be one. Profits are gonna be one half, right? Uh, one times one half is gonna be one half. Total profits is one third. That's just from this one half and this one fourth. 
All right, and then the last one. Uh, yeah, this is the last one. Last one is our second degree price discrimination problem. You do not want to do bundling here. You definitely don't want to do bundling here. We know we can't do bundling because we are told that we have, first off, we have two different versions, different versions of a product, high quality or low quality, firstly. And then secondly, we are told each consumer buys at most one version of the product. So there's no scope for bundling. This has to be second degree price discrimination because there's they're not going to buy both high quality and low quality. They're only going to buy one or the other. All right. So for the first part, well, let's see. The marginal cost to produce low quality is five. Marginal cost to produce high quality is 25. There's two types of consumers, 100 of each type, and these are their willingness to pay. So suppose you're only going to offer the low quality version, find the optimal price and profit. Suppose you're going to only offer the high quality version, optimal price and profit. And suppose you offer both versions, find the optimal price and profit. All right, so for the low quality version, basically I've got two things to check. Firstly, are my profits higher if I set the price at 25 and sell to both? Or is it higher if I sell at 40 and sell just to type A consumers? And I've got the same calculation to do for high quality. Is my profits higher if I sell at a price of 120 only to type A? Or is my profits higher if I sell at a price of 50 to both? Right. And then suppose I offer both versions. Now the thing that we've got to do so for sure, I'm going to want to set the price of the low quality equal to 25. I want to, I want to remember, there's, remember, there's two problems we worry about with second degree price discrimination. The first is our low valuation consumers just might not buy at all. And the second is our high valuation consumers might pretend they're low valuation consumers. In other words, our type A's might pretend that they are type B's. So firstly, the first problem is I have to set the price low enough so that type B consumers buy. Right? So set the price at 25. Good. They're going to buy low quality. Now I, have to set, now I have to set the price of high quality, and you might think I want to set it at 120. Can't do that. Why? If I set the price at 120, my type A consumers get consumer surplus of zero for buying high quality, but if they buy low quality, they'll get consumer surplus of 15, which tells me the highest price I can set high quality is going to be 105. Right? All right, so we see this here. Uh, when we are selling only low quality, it turns out it turns out we're better off setting a price of 25. Our profits are going to be 4,000. That's better than selling the low quality to to only the high valuation consumer, right? Where we'd have 3,500. When we're selling only high when we're selling only high quality, uh, our profits our optimal price is our optimal price is going to be 120. Our profits are going to be 120 minus 25 times 100. That's 9,500. That's better than selling the high quality to both consumers where our profits would be 5,000. And then lastly, as I was saying, when we're selling both qualities, we'll set a price of 25 for the low quality, any higher, and then we, our, type, our type B consumers won't buy, won't buy low quality. And then we wanna set a price of 105 for high quality, not 120, because then our type A's are gonna buy the low quality instead. Uh, our profits are ultimately gonna be, what, 10,000. So anyway, hope you enjoy, hope you enjoy this solution video. And I will see you next time.